Part 2 continues with the second half of our PowerPoint presentation. And so onto the design. We'll start at the front of the site. We've got a variety of light and shade conditions here, and a tall vertical space in the sun. This space might end up constituting a zone too, depending on what goes here. We've got a few obvious limitations. Firstly, we're using a space that has no soil in any way, shape or form. Secondly, we've got no water either. We don't even have a tap out here to provide water to the plants, so we'll need to bring water to here from elsewhere. Thirdly, there are rumours going around the flats that the carports may soon be replaced, and we don't know with what. However, this might give us an opportunity to pinch some of the wood or the shade cloth for our own use. One possible design for the front garden would be as follows. Here we see a top-down plan of the front of the flat. Firstly, there's no water access from the front of the site, so we might have to run a hose from the rear. This can go out the door as pictured, or it can go through the front window. Then we arrange planter pots around the edges of the carport. Note that we walk in straight from the front door, and that the plant arrangement is thicker away from the wall, where there is a second point of access, the driveway. The irrigation is loosely attached and fed around the pots to feed things with drippers, which may need to be irregularly spaced depending on what is planted. Note that while the diagram shows square pots for simplicity, you can always shuffle pots around to make a rounder, more organically shaped garden. The western end would probably be a good place for taller plants, since they wouldn't be covered up with shade cloth. However, we might have shorter plants in the middle against the wall, since there is a window that we might not want covered up. Lastly, there might be room in the corner of the entry for a few more plants, although it would be easier to water them by hand. There are a few more ideas that might be implemented one day. We all love the idea of growing deciduous vines instead of putting up shade cloth, but we put that on hold on the ground so they might not actually bear any fruit in the time that Sophia is living there. This can take a couple of years in a typical scenario. Also, it's a bit hard to grow them in pots. Furthermore, with appropriate permission from the landlord, it may be possible to capture some water from the roof and water the plants from the downpipe. We'd still need a backup plan though, if such a tank were to run dry. We do have vertical space for a trellis, but there is also space at the top of the carport and the entry for hanging containers. There may be small pots that could be hung up there, or we may look at getting a fruit dryer, which would be easier to get running in Adelaide's increasingly dry climate. Finally, we considered making the gap in the garden go all the way through, so that young Derek could pedal his tricycle through there. We ultimately gave up on this though, since he might not be encouraged to play out there much anyway, especially since it's a shared driveway. However, Tina came up with the idea of, of putting a track around some of the planter pots and giving Derek some toy cars, for example, to run around with while Soph tends to the plants. One of the things we wanted to figure out with this project was what kinds of food and how much food could be grown on the site. As Tina dug a little deeper, no pun intended, we found that there are varieties of pretty much anything that can be grown in modestly sized pots. The photos show some of the more interesting examples in the catalogue of the Diggers Club. In the top left, the red Marietta marigold, a flowering plant that is intended to repel pests. In the top right, New St. Valerie carrots, which can be grown as either baby carrots or full-sized. A breed of cauliflower with heads about the size of a clenched fist. And a five-colour mix of silver beet. Tina also took the photo in the centre, which shows a single pot growing a range of different herbs. In effect, it's like a complete herb garden that you can hang up in your garden during the day and bring directly into the kitchen when it's time to cook. The example in the photo is ready-made, but it's a neat example of what can be grown in a single pot. Because we have a small amount of vertical space, there is an opportunity to grow something a bit taller. We get plenty of light out the front, and we can put up a trellis if need be but we can't provide much for plants that need deep roots. Tina suggested a few options here as well, noting that some varieties of miniature fruit tree can be grown in pots. The first photo, which she took at a local Bunnings, is of a dwarf peach tree, some of which barely grow to a metre in height. Pots can be used to plant many types of fruit, including apples, berries, pears and plums. The picture on the right is of a bean teepee. The frame of the teepee is built in or around any plants that creep or crawl in this case runner beans, and the plants grow to follow the frame. It's a novel idea to create not only useful plants, 
but also an interesting space underneath. The rear of the site is even more space constrained than the front, not least of which because there is some living space out here for a clothesline. There's also a balcony overhanging part of the yard. However, all of the water infrastructure of at least the ground floor flats runs along the back wall, and the bathroom, toilet, laundry and kitchen are all on this side of the flat. This means that both mains water and whatever spare water comes from inside the house are readily available. Here is a diagram of the back of the house, showing some of the areas that are up for grabs. Remember, we're looking at a backyard totaling less than 9 metres wide, and less than 2 metres deep, not including the pavement. Firstly, Sophia has already started collecting food scraps for a worm farm. The plan is to make the western corner an area for Derek to play in. Perhaps a sand pit could be installed here. In the eastern corner, there is room for a water feature, as a way of attracting wildlife to the area. There's also room for plants, although you'd want something that will reach up for the sunlight, such as a small tree or a climbing bean. The planters and the spaces between them will also give Derek a bit more space to run around or ride his tricycle. Lastly, there will be space for other collections of composting material. One of the problems with using water well inside the house is that there isn't much to spare outside the house. I came up with an idea of how a rainwater capture system might be built temporarily. I got the idea from the sheet of corrugated polycarbonate roofing in the southwest corner of the yard where the sand pit would be. This could be mounted over the clothesline so that a gutter could be used to channel water. We need about 4 metres of width by 2 metres of depth of roofing, about 6 or 7 times the sheet that we've got, and 4 metres of guttering to channel the water. This would also act as a temporary roof over the clothesline area in the wet season. Given an annual rainfall of around 400 millimetres, and provided we kept everything clean, we're looking at about 3,200 litres of rainwater per year, about three times what would be consumed as drinking water for the occupants. We've even found some collapsible water tanks, up to a thousand litres, that we could erect underneath. The challenge, ironically for a rainwater system, would be to make the system weatherproof. You wouldn't want the gully winds to blow this around too much, or at worst, to flow over it instead of under it. If more were required, more sheets could be mounted on poles to hold everything up. We probably won't be going this far though, with plants at ground level, we might prefer just to let the rain fall straight on the plants. Again, the problem would be to make such a system sturdy. With this in place, we could capture another few kiloliters of rainwater every year. In the last section of this presentation, we will talk about the resources available in the local community. Many of Soph's neighbours grow fruit and vegetables of their own, and some of them even live without cars. This would leave the space in the driveway a bit more free and useful for social gatherings among the neighbours. One idea that Soph had was to throw a party for the neighbourhood as a chance to meet and greet, and to hold it here in the driveway. Soph has also started harvesting recyclable and organic waste on the nights when wheelie bins are collected. If more people start making a habit of this in the area, it might be possible to organise it a bit better for the people doing their own composting. There are lots of useful resources in the wider community as well. One decision that Soph has made is not to buy a washing machine. Where possible, clothes will be washed by hand in the laundry tub at the rear of the house. Otherwise, there is a laundromat nearby, which can also serve a more social role, as it does in other small space communities around the world. There are also a number of shops nearby that specialise in environmentally friendly products. Firstly, there is a stall called Ecolateral, which sells all manner of eco-friendly cleaning products, water-saving devices and low-energy gadgets. There is also something of a hub of organic produce outlets, selling fruit, vegetables, grains, cosmetics, baby care products and even meat, although that last item won't factor too much in this case because Soph is a vegetarian. That concludes the PowerPoint show, and with it concludes part two of our project. In part three, we actually start implementing our design. Stay tuned.